Simply Financial with Christopher Calandra, Certified Financial Planner, is an innovative, comprehensive, informative, and cutting-edge podcast that discusses financial topics ranging from personal finance, economics, politics, and personal growth. Simply Financial will cover intriguing and thought-provoking questions so that the listener can simply increase their financial IQ. Welcome to episode number 50 of season number three of the Simply Financial podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Calandra. Today, my guest is Alina Trigub. She is the founder of Samo Financial, and she's involved in commercial real estate. She's a regular speaker on the subject. And one of the descriptions I saw about Alina in my preparation for today's discussion is how much she loves helping people. Uh, She gets a tremendous amount of satisfaction when her investors find investments that suit their goals and plans. So Alina, thank you so much for joining me today. Chris, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. I'm really excited. I know we had uh, had a full start a while ago, and this was a reschedule, so this has been uh, uh, a little bit in the making, so I'm glad we finally connected and are together this morning. Maybe we could start, Alina, for my listeners, and you could tell us a little bit of your background to start with. Absolutely, Chris. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Alina Trigub. Um, I started my uh, professional career by um, receiving an accounting degree um, from City University of New York, and I worked as a tax accountant for a little while, but never really enjoyed that field. Um, so I decided to switch to the information technology field where I'm still working. Um, I worked in different uh, roles and you know, had different capacities, but mainly most of my roles evolved around being the liaison between business and technology and kind of help to connect the two worlds. And while doing that, um, I was uh, always concerned about you know, our family paying um, higher taxes, being in a higher tax bracket. So um, finding a way to lower taxes has been on my mind for a while. And given my tax and accounting background, um, I always thought about that. And uh, same goes for real estate. I've thought about real estate, but um, didn't really take any um, significant action until about six or seven years ago when I finally decided to take action and started researching as to what kind of um, real estate investing um, we can do. And um, after unsuccessfully searching locally for property where the numbers would make sense, I decided to uh, look out of state. And while doing my out of state research, I came across the world of syndications. And for those that may not be familiar with what syndication is, it's simply when a group of people um, joins the forces and buys a, a large um, real estate together, they, the money are pulled together, um, and a partnership is formed where there are people that are GPs, general partners, that do all the work of finding, inspecting, negotiating the property, and then managing it. And uh, the rest of the people are limited partners, LPs, or passive investors, as they also call, um, that uh, invest their funds um, into this investment and let the general partners um, do all the work. So I decided to um, give it a try, and after doing the research, I invested as a limited partner in in the syndication. And after the first one, I did the second one and the third one, and um, the the process kind of flowed in after that. And after realizing the tremendous benefits of this passive investing and realizing that it's not Um, very common, not a lot of people are familiar with this concept, Um, I decided to bring this to market and share it with other folks, and I formed my own company with, again, the sole purpose of um, spreading the word and uh, educating other folks and helping other people that may also not have the capacity or desire to be active landlords and get the phone calls in the middle of the night about problems with the property, but simply um, um, having a way of investing in real estate and becoming partial property owners um, through these syndications 
um, give them the ability to do so uh, by partnering up with us. And so uh, receiving passive income, also saving on taxes, and um, the third, also very important component to me at least, is the social impact because um, the strategy that we're implementing when we're buying properties is typically a value-add strategy, which essentially entails that we buy a property and we renovate it, whether it's apartment complex or maybe it's a mobile home park community. So we try to change it for the better to attract the right kind of tenants so the tenants would stay with us longer because we make the community um, attractive to them and that uh, and we make it a place where people want to stay. And that to me is, is a huge positive impact uh, by, you know, I'm helping um, potential tenants on one end where uh, they are coming into community where they want to live for a long time and um, helping passive investors on the other end where uh, they're making money on this and doing it completely passively just uh, as they planned. Uh, so to me, that's also another tremendous benefit, uh, benefit that is um, beneficial on both, both ends. And uh, that's what Samo Financial is about. By so, um, so how long ago did you um, found Samo? <laughs> Um, it's been almost two years since I found Samo Financial. Beautiful. Now, let me, let me ask you this, Alina. Obviously, people could individually buy properties, multifamilies, commercial, single family. They could rehab. There's a number of ways you can do it. Uh, and then also, you could go into the publicly traded marketplace. Basically, go to the stock market, and there are lots of publicly traded real estate investment trusts where you're buying into a portfolio of real estate. And so those are two common ways that people invest in real estate. Is it fair to say, Alina, that the syndicate is a little like the publicly traded REIT companies, just on a smaller scale where it's part of a syndicate? Are, are they kind of similar in that way? Um, they're similar in terms of the business strategy where properties are bought and repositioned, they're different uh, from a tax perspective because the, the income produced by REITs is ordinary income and the income produced through syndications, uh, private placements is for the most part um, passive gains and losses where one can be netted against the other. And, you know, with gains, gains can go to as high as 20%, where ordinary income is, could be treated for some folks at as high as, what, what's the highest, 39% these days? Right, right. Okay. So The main so, benefit. So with the syndicate, what you help your clients do is identify suitable syndicates that they may want to invest in. Is that right? Sure. So uh, I, whatever projects I'm working on, um, I share it with my clients. And I, again, I share it based on their interests that they've expressed to me. And it's up to them whether they want to invest with us or not. Uh, but these are the projects that have been um, vetted by the sponsors and then fully vetted by me as a second stage. And now it's up to the investors whether they want to partner up and join us on these projects. Because it seems to me the syndicate process is attractive in many ways, although a key element of that is identifying good syndicate sponsors because those partners, the, the, um, the general partner or the person running the sponsor, I guess is a better way to say it, I mean, they need to be good at their job because they're the ones identifying the properties, making the purchase decisions, deciding on the repositioning plan, and ultimately deciding on selling the property. So how do you screen for good sponsors? Sure, Chris. And, and that's definitely step number one, screening for sponsors. Uh, the next steps would be evaluating the market the sponsors are in and then evaluating the offering itself. But uh, going back to screening the, the sponsors, um, it's more or less like a dating process. You can do it overnight. It takes time to establish relationship and build them. 
um, we go through the extensive questionnaire that we've developed over the time. And then um, obviously evaluating the prior projects that the sponsors worked on, looking at their underwriting, um, verifying their strategy, um, uh, verifying the um, plan that they have for a particular offering that they're presenting, and then also getting to know them as a person because um, aside from being uh, a business partner, um, if you're planning to work with someone for a very long time, um, in my mind it's absolutely essential to make sure that um, you and your potential business sponsor um, are getting along well. So that personal component is absolutely critical, and I always refer people back to Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. If it's not someone that you're getting along with, it's not someone with whom your strategy is aligned, and for whatever reason, you know, it doesn't mean that one is wrong, one is right. It's just, uh, it, you know, you and the other partner may not be uh, the right type of people that would get along well. Then, you know, it's time to move on and find someone else because um, having that full understanding is, is very, very critical on the personal and on the business level. And so we, we go through that process of verifying and validating partners, which takes um, sometimes several months, sometimes it could take uh, up to a year to do. Very good. And let me ask you this. You mentioned earlier on that uh, you are where you are based, you're typically not um, acquiring real estate and not involved in syndicates in your area. You're in the uh, New York City metro area, right? Correct, correct. We're, we're in New Jersey, very close to New York. Um, yeah, the, the numbers simply don't make sense here. Um, having cap rates uh, at 3 to 4 percent is not attractive. There's no way we can um, have our investors make income in this area. That's why we try to go into the markets uh, that can offer cash flow for our investors because that's the, the main um, objective here. Can you tell us some areas that have been attractive for you guys recently? If it's not New York metro area, where has there been some attractive deals where you can get uh, better returns and superior cash flow? Sure. Um, it depends on the asset class, but if we take apartment complexes, um, some of the most attractive markets for us where we invested have been Dallas-Fort Worth area or Houston area. Um, there is tremendous growth. Uh, the infrastructure is there. Um, the jobs are coming in. People are going into that area. Texas is one of the personal income tax-free states, so it's definitely attractive. Cost of uh, living is very affordable, and, and the climate is relatively warm, so people are attracted to that. And then the jobs. Um, large companies that just keep going to to their um, to, to Texas area, and that is attractive to us as well. And so these are some of the areas where we bought properties. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so let's switch gears a little bit, Alina. Uh, and so when you were growing up, did you grow up in a house that would was poor? Was it? lower middle class, upper middle class? Did you grow up in an affluent household? What kind of household did you grow up in? Um, I would say it was probably, you know, lower to middle class um, household, but uh, it wasn't here. I, I grew up in a former Soviet Union, so it was a completely different environment. Completely different environment. I imagine that's very, very true. So when did you come to the United States? Um, I came here as a young adult, and I went for my undergraduate degree directly. Um, so that's that's where I started awesome. my career as a student at Baruch. Okay, Baruch is um, is, that's a, a is that a SUNY school in New York? A yep, city of New it York is. School? Okay. Yep. Very yeah, good. Baruch. Was well known for its uh, accounting graduates. That was attractive to me since I decided to major in accounting, so I applied for Bar Baruch and was accepted. And uh, it was a good choice. I got my uh, first job at Ernst & Young before I even graduated, so it was definitely a good choice of school. Very good. So w when you came to the United States, what did you learn about money now that you were in a completely different country, uh, different 
um, system. What, what did you learn about money early on when you got to uh, New York? Um, well, it, it took a while to learn about money. First, I needed to learn how to survive. So I, I've always worked uh, throughout both of my undergrad and even graduate degree. Um, and uh, but, but what I did learn is that uh, there were ways to earn money where, um, you know, in for, former Soviet Union, even if you were getting paid, it wasn't enough. I, I was raised by a single mom, and she, from what I remember, she's had two jobs for uh, most of my life because, um, you know, she needed to find a way to support us. Where here, uh, you know, I, I could go get a few part-time jobs, and that was enough to get by, you know, for, you know, the poor immigrants that weren't looking for much at that time. So I, I was really thrilled to know that, you know, the, the, there are plenty of opportunities, and if you work smart and hard, then you, you'd be able to make a good living and, um, you know, live a good life. Very good. That's uh, well said. So uh, you're involved in, you've been involved in, in accounting and finance for a very long time. Now you have evolved into a specialist with commercial real estate and syndicates in particular. So can you share with us some of the money rules that you have personally, I know you're focused on helping people. I'm also quite sure that you're interested in building wealth for you and your family. So what are some of the money rules that you have as you navigate through business and investing? I I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett, and I, I really like what he says. So um, one of his most common expressions is uh, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Okay. I, I try to follow that. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't always come out as true. Obviously, I've invested in the stock market for many years, um, and we've lost some money. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, we purchased... Uh, property in the past and we lost money on that but this was before I became an investor we bought it without doing much research so it's not always possible plus as every other human I um, learn from my own mistakes more than I learned from other people mistakes uh, but you know I, I'm uh, I've been always uh, um, more cautious about what I do and how I do it. So th the plan has always been uh, to only take the loans where it made sense and try to repay loans and then build financial future for myself, for my family, for our children now. And that's what my husband and I have been working on for many years, and I think we're, we're doing a good job with that. Beautiful. And there are so many books on investing, building wealth, uh, whether it's real estate, stock market, uh, building entrepreneurial small businesses. You mentioned one of the all-time great books, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, what are some of your other favorite books on wealth building? Sure. So some of my favorites, actually, one of my favorite books is the book that's ancient, that's literally 100 years old, uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. And yeah. then another book, which is also older, um, is Think and, Gr and Grow Rich. I, I really, truly do love those books. And, you know, for folks that are starting out and potentially interested to be entrepreneurs, I always mention Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but that, that's every single real estate investor's favorite. That is very true. It's such a... Uh impactful book and uh, The Richest Man in Babylon that's Agmondino right? I think it's George Clayson Clayson yeah oh okay yeah I, I'm um, I'm misremembering but uh, so that's that's great and so with uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad which is uh, an enormous advocate for investing in real estate as well as being independent and entrepreneurial, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, the author. Uh, are there any other books in the real estate realm that you would suggest my listeners might check out if they're 
considering or maybe already involved in real estate investing in some way, shape, or form? Absolutely. So most of the real estate books are written based on specific asset class. Um, in my case, um, I've been uh, fascinated and I started my investing career with apartment complexes, multifamily. Um, two of my favorite books would be the two of David Lindell books. Um, one is called Multifamily Millions. Um, I don't remember the name of the other one, but he wrote two books, and both are extremely great foundational. And then as, as we kind of wrap up, I also know that you are involved with um, one or more groups in the New York, New Jersey area where investors get together, I believe, and, and I have to make it to a, a meeting. I know you've invited me. We haven't worked it out where investors get together and share ideas, best practices, talk about opportunities, just become more educated in the realm of real estate investing. So um, can you tell us just a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Chris. I, I run two real estate investing meetups. One is in northern New Jersey area. The other one is in Manhattan. So uh, we uh, open our doors to anyone and everyone who wants to learn. And while my personal concentration is in syndication, the topics are uh, typically go to a much broader range from uh, mortgages to personal development so, for example, today I actually have a meetup in New York City, and we are going to be talking about how to raise private capital. So the topics range in variety, and the presenters range in variety from accountants to attorneys to mortgage brokers to anyone else. And, yes, we, you're more than welcome to come to our group, and uh, we would welcome an opportunity to have you. Beautiful. Tom, thank you for the invite, and we will have to make that happen. Uh, so... For people that are interested, and I imagine a lot of folks are not very familiar with syndication, if they wanted to get more information about syndication as well as how you and SAMO Financial might be able to help, how could they get more information about you and SAMO? They can find me on my website, which is samofinancial.com, or through social media handles such as LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram. Terrific. Thank you so much, Aline. I really am glad we finally connected with one another. It's been a little bit of a, a tough road. It was a good discussion. I think the syndication strategy is uh, a fascinating one, and uh, I'm glad we had a chance to speak, and one of these days hopefully we'll be able to meet in person. Thanks again. Absolutely, Chris. It's my pleasure, and thanks again for inviting me to your show. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Sage Point Financial Incorporated and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of the information provided at these websites, nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to your use of third-party technologies websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. Securities and advisory services are offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management, LLC, not affiliated with Sage Point Financial. Simply Financial is part of the Exvadio Podcast Network. You can find Xvadio podcasts at xvadio.com slash podcast, the Apple Podcasts app, iTunes Store, iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you find podcasts. So join us and stay informed and entertained.